Having seen what the railway companies produced, I'll now be looking at the artists involved. And I'll be looking later at the artwork they created. The London, Midland and Scottish Railway caused quite a stir when in 1923 they began to commission Royal Academy artists to produce artwork for their larger posters. It quickly became clear that the advertising departments of the railways were going to aim high in terms of the quality of their artwork. Charles Knight, for example, who later became the Vice President of the Royal Watercolour Society, was asked by the Queen Mother in 1944 to give Princess Margaret painting lessons. Whoever was good enough for royalty was good enough for the railways. Britain has been pre-eminent in her contribution of watercolours to the world's art. The list of the artists employed by the railways for carriage prints appears a little like a who's who of prominent watercolour artists for the period. Roland Hilda, Sir Henry Rushbury, Jack Marriott, Stanley Badmin, Leonard Squirrel and James Mackintosh Patrick are just some who got involved. Many were members of institutes and societies, such as the Royal Institute of Painters in Watercolours, the RI, the Royal Watercolour Society, RWS, and the Royal Academy, the RA. A sprinkling of artwork in oils appears too. The artists painting for the railways were often a very small part of their working career. As someone has pointed out, the most important thing an artist can draw is their wage. Just after the war, artists were not immune from the very tough conditions the country was facing. Work was hard to come by. During the conflict, some artists had contributed to the war effort by being in active service, others had helped with camouflage projects on naval vessels and airfields, and still more had worked on a government-funded art project called Recording Britain. Post-war, well-paid work for companies such as London Transport, Shell, the Post Office, British Marketing Boards and the Railways was a golden opportunity to resurrect their careers. There were some, however, who were embarrassed by having to produce commercial artwork to make a living. There was a certain art snobbery at the time. It's only in recent years that this form of artwork has gained the respectability that it so richly deserves. Artists such as Norman Wilkinson, Jack Marriott, Claude Buckle, Frank Wooten and Terence Cuneo seem to have no such qualms in this respect and achieved a prolific output of paintings for the railways, especially in the realm of poster production. It's also clear from interviews with their relatives that they thoroughly enjoyed their landscape painting in the process. And talking of the artist's relatives, Frida Marston was the gifted, hard-grafting great-aunt I never met. The professional painter who could capture the beauty and the truth of a landscape with eye and brush. Through the 1920s, the 30s and the 40s, she devoted herself to her art. Painting was her sole source of income. She was born in Hampstead in 1895 and studied at Regent Street Polytechnic. She spent four years in Northern Italy working with the landscape painter John Terrick Williams. And among other places, she exhibited at the Royal Academy and she was elected to the Royal Institute of Oil Painters in 1925. My mother remembered being asked as a girl by Frieda to go out into the woods and the fields to collect wild flowers. It was wartime and Frieda couldn't travel to the places where she liked to paint. And so she worked with still lives, flower paintings, selling them to galleries in London. 
but perhaps her greatest achievement was to be the only female artist commissioned by railway companies to produce landscapes used for carriage prints. She also created artwork for railway posters too. Frieda's watercolour of Boston painted for a carriage print is a wonderful example of her descriptive talent. She has chosen for her easel a bend in the river so that it curls away from the eye like the central narrative of a story. The river is tidal and it's low water. Boats are tilted on the mud below the curving quays and the waterfront properties are a colourful assortment of timber sheds warehouses, a shop and an elegant Georgian pile that might be a hotel. A road shaded by trees leads the eye towards the magnificent tower of St Botolph's Church. Its 266 foot high lantern tower cushioned by a Fenland cumulonimbus cloud. In one glance Frieda offers 500 years of urban geography while the river, of course, winds all the way back to the Vikings and the Romans and even the hunter-gatherers who first fished the tidal waters of the Witham. She was fascinated by the movement of light on water and sky, light which shines as keenly today from her paintings as it did when her brushes performed their artistry nearly a century ago.